Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Today I want to talk about two books that I recently read back to back. They were a great pair, a weird pair, at absolutely the opposite ends of the spectrum. The first is Antigone Rising, The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths by Helen Morales. If you've watched the booktube newbie tag I filmed when I first started my channel last September, you already know that I've been obsessed with Antigone since I was a teenager. I saw Antigone as a part of me, the good part and the bad part. I really will talk about that more sometime in the future, maybe along with the discussion of early versions, later versions, and also some new retellings. Anyway, I was thrilled to hear that there was a new book exploring the connection between Antigone and modern social justice movements. Well, it turns out that Helen Morales' very brief little book, Antigone Rising, has very little to say about Antigone specifically. And honestly, it doesn't seem like the book has that much to say about ancient myths in general. The author's main point is to connect current social issues from the environmental crisis to rape culture to classical antiquity. She doesn't argue that Greek and Roman myths created the social problems, nor does she argue that those myths offer a progressive response. What she says is only that we can look back with today's issues in mind and perhaps draw some parallels with either the early versions of the stories we have or with more contemporary retellings. Some of those myths reinforce the traditional power hierarchy, and some suggest that they can be reclaimed in some way to help us fight injustice. I find many of the chapters fairly weak. The essay about diets, for example, seems to me to lack an argument. When Morales talks about rape, and even about dress codes, she's a little more successful. My favorite chapter falls near the end, recounting how Beyonce recreates ancient imagery, the so-called roots of Western culture, to be both more inclusive and more progressive. I was especially intrigued by the author's account of the video Ape Shit, where Beyonce and Jay-Z take over the Louvre Art Museum. Morales presents some relatively interesting interpretations in this chapter, although much of her analysis also makes it into general social media discussions about the video. Interestingly, Beyonce is coming under a bit of fire by African activists for her new, soon-to-be-released film video, which will be aired on Disney+. Plus. Some of the protesters are irked that she's usurping African culture to line her pockets, even though Disney Plus doesn't air in Africa. Others have argued that it isn't a fair critique, since Beyonce is trying hard to figure out ways to have the film shown there, and she's also hired a large number of African artists. The other criticism by young African activists from across the continent has been more interesting, I think. To be honest, they're basing their concerns on a very brief clip, the only thing released so far. Many young Africans are a bit frustrated by what they're seeing as a universalizing of a highly diverse set of cultures across the continent, an implication that Africa has not changed in centuries rather than recognizing its modernity, potentially a romanticizing of African power structures, and a reliance sometimes on cultural stereotypes created predominantly by white people and adopted by American blacks sometimes who are often fairly removed from what Africa is now, and that it is in some ways cultural appropriation. Like I said earlier, this critique is very preliminary, and it might be quite a bit less problematic when the whole video is available. And from what I saw, no one was suggesting that she as a performer or creative force should be canceled or anything like that. But the protesters are suggesting that Beyonce has some things she needs to think about more. And of course, who doesn't? In several of the examples of supposed cancel culture, the fight is between two groups who are both victims of some form of discrimination. Yes, of course, Beyonce is a person with enormous wealth and a huge platform. 
But what she's trying to do in her work, it seems to me, is address the racial injustice she sees all around her in the United States and that she's experienced personally. And she's trying to amplify the voices of marginalized people who don't have the same kind of platform she has. For a famous artist or writer or whatever, to speak up against injustice is important. But as we all know from experience, I would think, whenever we speak up, we often don't fully think through or understand all of the ways our words might affect other marginalized groups. This isn't a criticism of Beyonce, and it isn't a defense of her either. It's a call for all of us to recognize that when people do whatever wrong thing they might do out of goodwill and engage in rigorous but respectful discussions with those people of goodwill on both sides, both sides learn more about where they stand and why they disagree and what they're assuming. People who are working for justice, even when we disagree with how they're doing it, are not our enemies. Anyway, back to Antigone Rising. Later in her book, Morales summarizes her thesis. We look to antiquity to provide examples of human behavior, ways of living that confirm, challenge, and expand the possibilities for how we live today. As an historian, I'm all for looking at what we know about the past to see how and why it happened and how it shaped our world. As I mentioned in part one of my nonfiction discussion of the book about the Radcliffe Institute for Independent Study. But in that book, The Equivalence, it's clear that the author was investigating how a moment of cultural transformation worked. Just saying that there are some things from antiquity that are like now, some that are different, and many that we should just rewrite to fit with our own goals, makes me wonder why Morales believes we should hold on to that history and those myths in any way. Is it to reverse them? She says, the misogyny of the original representation of one problematic story is rendered impotent by the change in cultural memory. Faded meaning can be a form of resistance. If we partially forget something, is that really resistance? I think if it has any power still, we'd be unlikely to forget it as a culture. And if the original fades so much, why exactly should we hold on to it at all? Really, I'm not suggesting we discard the classics at all, just wondering how Morales herself would answer this question given her other arguments. I find the style of Antigone Rising kind of irritating and banal. She seems to be far more interested in making quick provocative pronouncements about hot-button political issues than actually thoughtfully considering the link between those issues and Greek history and mythology. Since I was expecting a more serious, politically aware book, her quick social media style argumentation, or perhaps claims as a better word, was a huge disappointment. I've said before that when I have expectations for either the quality or content of a book or film, and it doesn't meet those expectations, I often struggle. Have any of you read this book? Am I being unfair? The other book I read in this pairing is Lost in Thought, The Hidden Pleasures of an Intellectual Life by Zena Hitz. It was totally the opposite of Antigone Rising. First, it's very carefully written and thoughtfully argued throughout. Second, rather than approach literature as a way to talk about politics, Hitz insists that we must be very careful to draw a clear separation between politics and literature. I don't think I agree with this side of the equation either, but she certainly presents her point much more thoughtfully and rigorously than does Morales and Antigone Rising. She insists that for the intellectual life to have deep meaning, it must be inherently useless. That is, readers need to read not to prepare them for good grades or good jobs or higher salaries or even to bring about social justice or even relieve suffering. Learning for learning's sake is her goal. She even writes a section that seems to speak directly to the author of Antigone Rising. We sometimes imagine that intellectual work can open room for conversation and communion on hot-button topics, 
but such attempts are rarely successful. Her argument is that, as she says, our fears are often frozen in place thanks to the anxiety provoked by broad and open disagreement. Therefore, real and personal inquiry can get shut off. And it's that personal interior excavation that Hitz seems to privilege most, and which I suppose I value most as well in my personal life, despite the fact that I absolutely love the social communion over books and ideas that I got both as a student and as a professor that I get from conversation about books with my family members and that I get here on Booktube. Although Hitz teaches at St. John's College, the so-called Great Books College, where students and tutors do the intellectual communion every day, I think she's less interested in that community aspect of reading. She wants readers to learn to be wise, to be understanding, to be humble, and to see, as she says, a fuller form of humanity because of their free exploration of literature and ideas, but not because it's their goal. And she herself believes that the self-reflection that learning provides helps her and others approach, quote, union with God. Although that belief is key for her, Hitz does not insist that others experience the outcome of self-reflection in that way. I've said before that I'm a secular person, and I have to admit that I'm not sure what she sees as the secular equivalent of the human movement toward union with God. What resonated with me is that union with humanity as a whole, with a natural world larger than humanity, and that might be what she's getting at. Learning allows this moment of interiority. I've been calling it self-reflection, but it's also a moment of self-effacement, of seeing a larger world all around us. So I don't think this is a perfect book in any way, and I know Hitz has not persuaded me with all of her arguments but she left me with a great deal to think about. Incidentally, she refers quite a bit to Elena Ferrante's Quartet, which I haven't read yet. If you're a fan, you might be intrigued by some of the literary analysis she does on these books. After I read them, I think I really want to come back to Hitz's Lost in Thought. In short, with some small hesitations, I recommend this book to anyone who isn't put off by the idea of a slow and thoughtful text. Thanks for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.